buses with blacked out windows, cameras that scan for any movement, sensors buried in the dirt, armed choppers that patrol the skies, ominous signs that warn of deadly force. The secrecy that's long been the trademark of Area 51 is as pronounced today as it's ever been. Whatever's going on inside, no one's going to talk about it. For decades, the government would not admit the existence of Area 51. Its code name disappeared from maps. Employees couldn't tell their own spouses where they worked. No one knew about it. No, you, have, you never heard a groom lake in those days, or Area 51. Electrical whiz T.D. Barnes was working for NASA in the 60s when he first focused on Area 51. He knew from radar signatures that something very fast was flying around out there. Barnes was recruited by the CIA to join the Groom Lake team, although this kind of teamwork was pretty unusual. You never talked about each other's jobs. There's some of the guys I, I worked with out there, flew up there, stayed all week with them. We played on the lake all weekend. To this day, I don't know what their, what their specialty was. We did not ask. If Area 51 had DNA, secrecy would be woven into it. Two years before Gary Powers was shot down. Lockheed genius Kelly Johnson needed an out-of-the-way place to test his spindly spy plane, the U-2, and the dry bed of Groom Lake seemed perfect. It was far from prying eyes, but still close to the already secure Nevada test site. In 1955, when the first U-2 was rolled out at Groom, the base, then known as Watertown, consisted of only a few buildings and hangars. For Francis Gary Powers and the other U-2 pilots and personnel, Area 51 was no garden spot, but the work was vital. The U-2 enabled America to find out what our adversaries were up to. Even before Powers U-2 was shot down over Russia, a successor to the plane was in the pipeline at Lockheed Skunk Works, a family of airplanes that would be known as Blackbirds. These things are the greatest airplanes ever built and still are to think that uh, 40 years ago and is still the world's fastest. Test pilot Bob Gilliland was chosen by Lockheed as the first man to fly the SR-71, one version of the Blackbird and the fastest plane to ever fly. When the U-2s moved out of Groom Lake, the Blackbirds moved in. They could travel faster than Mach 3, but at such speeds, the planes and the pilots got mighty warm. In a round number, it's about an 800 degree Fahrenheit airplane. And so a self-cleaning oven is I understand it's a 425 and a soldering iron's about 550, so you can see it's a lot harder than that. And they said, uh, well, we want to know if you want to volunteer to do something. I said, well, what am I going to do? He said, we can't tell you. <laughs> I said, okay, I'll volunteer. Military pilot Dennis Sullivan was recruited by the CIA to work at Groom Lake in the early 60s and to pilot the A-12, an early Blackbird. For the spy pilots, the Cold War seemed pretty hot. Various enemies were constantly trying to shoot them down, and just flying the planes was dangerous enough. The guy up in the, in the CIA headquarters told me one time, he said, you know, when we looked at this program and we started, we figured we were going to lose about 20 percent of you guys. And uh, while we didn't get shot down or anything, that's just about exactly what we did. There were other dangers. Area 51 was only a few miles from ground zero at the Nevada test site. The base was often showered with radioactive fallout from atomic tests. In later years, workers were exposed to toxic chemicals because of regular open pit burning at Groom Lake. Despite the risks, those who worked at Area 51 are proud of their roles, proud and tight-lipped. If something's going on out there, they don't want anyone to know about it. They're not going to know about it. It's it's not going to happen.